may not think it, but P has been a source of some major insights in chemistry. Without it, we might not have effective fertilizers, matches, or even tasty colas. Well, folks, you're in for a surprise because P led to the discovery of one of the first elements of the modern era. It may not be the number one discovery of all time, but it's still a discovery with number one. Medieval alchemists were in the business of trying to turn base metals into gold. They loved looking for connections, so if two things shared a similar color, they probably have something even more spectacular in common. So if urine has a golden hue, there's bound to be some connection with gold, right? This search for any missing link came from alchemists' desperation to find the Philosopher's Stone, a material that could turn anything into anything else, particularly into gold. So in the mid-1600s, alchemist Henning Brand, taking that crisp golden hue as a sign, thought he could make the Philosopher's Stone a reality with the crystals from boiled down pea. See, alchemists already knew that if they let urine fester, it made ammonia, a useful ingredient making silver mirrors. Brand, on the other hand, was the first to boil festering weed down until there was nothing left except a seemingly magical white paste. This white paste glowed in the dark, earning it the name Miraculous Bearer of Light, or in ancient Greek, Phosphorus. It wasn't the Philosopher's Stone, but it was the 13th element ever discovered. Known then as the Devil's Element, Phosphorus glowed in the dark, could burn up in the air, and was sourced from a seemingly infinite flow of material. Other alchemists, like the legendary Robert Boyle, caught on to Brand's discovery and began playing around with the stuff. This new pea-fueled field of study left alchemists so impressed that they started searching for even richer sources of the stuff. In fictionalized accounts, alchemists' logical train of thought held that more exotic sources gave better yields. So maybe some thought royal excrement would have higher concentrations of phosphorus. You know what they say, one man's royal waste is another man's miraculous bearer of light. By figuring out how to extract crystals from urine, ancient alchemists moved from exploring magic to understanding science. For this P process, they learned how to carefully control reactions to make useful things like dyes or medicines. And the flammable properties of phosphorus led to the first matches, making fire more portable and therefore useful. As phosphorus uses increased, chemists finally figured out a less fester needy source, bones. Eventually, phosphoric acid turned out to be useful for fertilizer, adding more fizz to carbonated beverages like cola, removing rust, and all sorts of other stuff. The discovery of phosphorus also lit up the stage for organic chemistry, which has given us the modern world through dyes, fuel, medicines, plastics, and longer lives. And all this P insight helped us understand that phosphorus is so essential for life, it's literally written into our DNA and provides energy in our cells. The modern world, brought to you by P and nature's dumpster divers, chemists. Uh, so, so, so moving along, talking about plant nutrition, um, that plants need many things to grow. Uh, and among them, we have all the mineral nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium are essential. Um, when we come back to phosphorus, we have known for at least five decades or even more that we need phosphorus for crop production and also we need for soil fertility because plants need in the seeds, roots, and the straws and as well as crop quality. Uh, phosphorus is also essential for animal health, that includes us. Um, we, we can find most of the phosphorus in the bone and teeth, um, same with humans. Uh, it's an essential ingredient in our DNA or nu nucleic acids. So at the same time, I think, I think the issue with most nutrients are, if we kind of go back, that the nutrients, we use it to grow plants. So if they end up in a water body, they're still a nutrient, so they're going to fuel algae or other things, which is also a plant. Um, so so the, the, the challenge is keeping the nutrients in the plant root zone. And if we are, can successfully do that, we don't have runoff or leaching issues. Um, as we look across the country, we have half of the rivers and lakes and estuarine areas which are impaired with the nutrients, both with nitrogen and phosphorus. And this is a snapshot from this summer's dead zone in Gulf of Mexico. 
Uh, and I think part of the reason why they said that they have higher uh, phytoplankton growth this year is because there was a lot of rainfall in Midwest. And as a result, there was a lot of nitrate and phosphate that run down to in Mississippi uh, and ended up in Gulf of Mexico, which kind of make, you know, if you have nutrients and there is a no flow connection, uh, the nutrients are not going anywhere. So we do need the water for them to get where, um, in this case, Gulf of Mexico. So close to home, we know that these two nutrients are also um, major pollutants, and we know that agriculture is a leading source of both of those nutrients. So, so we, we, we recognize the fact. Um, what's less known is that we also have other players, uh, which is stormwater and wastewater, which is a growing source of nutrients in the water bodies. Um, and we have almost more acreage under turf grass than our combined uh, corn, soybean, uh, and wheat. So something to keep in mind that when we are looking to find solutions to reduce nutrients in the bay, uh, we need a comprehensive approach. We need to look at all the sources and see what we can do to reduce their contribution. Uh, so talking about phosphorus in the, in the soils, um, so if we go in the pristine, um, let's say 1700, and we look into some of the soils where there are not, not any, have not been any plants, you're going to find that most of the phosphors originate from the rocks. Uh, and the rocks contain a mineral and many minerals such as calcium phosphate. So as the rock is weathered, so are the minerals. When minerals break down, they release phosphors into the soil, which is the main source um, of phosphors. Um, but over a period of, uh, call it evolution, uh, or growing crops, or plants, or manures, we have changed the phosphorus balance in the soils. Um, so if we look into the soils, we can find most of the phosphorus in organic farms. Um, and the rest of the phosphorus is, we find in combination with calcium, iron, and aluminum because they are the ones who keep phosphorus tightly absorbed in the soil. Um, when we look into the organic pool, that's where the soil microbes get to work. So they mineralize it because they need carbon, and as a result, they put phosphorus back into the soil solution. Um, so this complicated slide can, shows you that there are different organic phosphorus farms in the soil, um, but this orthophosphate, which is inorganic phosphorus, which I'm going to use the word orthophosphate quite a bit uh, from now on, this is the only pool that's accessible to plants. So if we have a lot of organics, uh, although they are in equilibrium with the orthophosphate pool, these are not directly available to the plants. So when we look at phosphor cycling in the soil, so we have fertilizers, uh, we have plant residues, uh, agriculture waste, manures, litters, we have biosolids, which are main inputs of nutrients or phosphorus into the soil. Uh, when we look at the way phosphorus can be lost, we have erosion runoff. Uh, we also have leaching that can go to groundwater and then connected surface waters. Um, just digging a little bit into the soils, uh, we see that there's a large pool of organic phosphorus which is bound with microbes and there's organic matter. Um, on the left side, we have all those inorganic pools which are combined with iron aluminum, uh, calcium, and then so everything as you see, all the arrows go back and forth. So as the plants start utilizing from the soil solution pool, it's replenished by a combination of other pools. So something to, to keep in mind. Um, and so the soil solution pool is really at the center of the phosphorus cycle. Um, some other comments about plant available phosphorus. We know that pH has a very strong influence on phosphorus availability. Um, so when we get into very low pH, for example, three here, which is you're not, never going to see um, in most places, that most of the phosphorus can be born fixed with iron. And as pH start increasing, we have more aluminum because aluminum become more available when the pH is about four to five. Um, so we're really looking into this narrow zone about 5.5 to seven, which is our neutral pH, where the phosphorus availability is going to be higher. Um, as we get into alkaline soils, high pH soils, more phosphorus can be found fixed with calcium. So there are two processes that control how much of inorganic phosphorus will be fixed in the soil. And these two are, the first step is adsorption. 
Uh, and the second step is what we call precipitation, which means mineral formation. So these are two shown here, the first sorption and second precipitation. So in the first sorption, in the acid soils, we have iron aluminum. In the high pH soils, it will typically be uh, calcium. And then when we look into the secondary pool, as you can see, there are a couple things can happen in the soil solution. So let's say the phosphorus is sorbed, and this is first phase, which is iron aluminum. And then when this becomes significant, then this precipitate out as a phosphorus mineral. Um, in some scenarios, you can see this cycle going back and forth. Most of the soils, this is the original source. So in some soils, when we have high phosphorus, uh, this can certainly go in this direction, as you can see by the arrows. But this is going to be controlled with the presence of calcium and iron and aluminum under those circumstances. Um, just another slide on the imp importance of soil pH is extremely critical. So we are operating in this very narrow zone when we have high phosphorus availability. Um, and here is, this is 5.5 to close to 7. Um, just not, not, try, not trying to make things more complicated, but actually this slide is that when you have a phosphorus in the soil solution, first it's going to go in this direction. So it will be weakly held by iron and aluminum. Um, at the same time, when phosphorus is released back into the soil solution, this is where you're going to find it. And as time goes on, uh, as you can see, this phosphorus is going to start moving towards the precipitate pool, which is in this scenario iron. Um, so it, it can quickly be fixed and precipitated. So it's still in the soil, not going anywhere. Um, it's, uh, it's not available to plants directly, but it can come back and be available because everything is in equilibrium with the phosphor cycle. Uh, as you can see, this is soil solution. We have all the inorganic uh, pools. This is the precipitated or the appetite phase. Uh, then we have a, a huge organic phosphor cycling going on in the soil. Um, the role of organic phosphors in controlling phosphorus availability is not very well defined. It varies from soil, although in the last few years there has been a, a lot of research trying to look at these connections that how much uh, that will contribute to the soil solution. We still don't know that. We have some ideas. Um, so looking back into the phosphorus in the plants, and I think this is actually a very simplified, easy graph. And if you look at the plant, it's in the sol solution P pool. Um, that's because this is the only pool that plants can utilize. But as you go towards these non-labile, which is mineral phase, um, you see these arrows. So there's a big arrow going in this direction. And there's a dotted arrow, which means that this pool can become available into labile, and labile pool can go into solution as this phosphorus is either utilized by the plants or it's lost from the soil solution pool. So this is, a, at the same time, plants don't have a huge need for phosphorus. They do have a need, and as you can see, it's really a tiny amount. So if you take a plant uh, material and then you digest and you analyze it, you're going to see that it's 0.2% of the total biomass that's tied up with phosphorus. Um, again, phosphorus is the most, second most important nutrient. I'm sure you all know that, what's the first nutrient? Nitrogen, yes. Um, and it controls a lot of processes within the plants, um, that it's critical for plants to actually grow and function. Um, at the same time, when we look at, into the soil solution pool, you're never going to see in most soils, the soil solution phase more than 0.1 milligram. Um, when you look within the plant, then you see there's a very high concentration, and this is plant's defense mechanism. So plants like to store a lot of phosphorus within the, within the plant so they can utilize it if they need. And if they not, don't, don't need it, they get rid of it, as I will show you in the next slide, um, or a slide after this. So when we look at phosphorus availability, some of the way the plants cope up with this is uh, there's a more biomass, more amount of roots, also the how widespread roots are. And then we also have mycorrhiza association with the roots that, plant, that help plants access more phosphorus, and, and uh, especially in those uh, circumstances when there is not enough phosphorus availability. Um, and some other phosphorus uptake process, this talks about how phosphorus is taken up by the plant. Uh, so there has been a lot of research looking at and some other, a uh, lot of time has been spent by plant physiologists to, to investigate that how phosphorus gets from the soil to the cells and what happens when it's within the cells. And that's something as a soil scientist I never thought I need to know, but it's actually very cool. 
um, the way the plant is. So um, one way, like this is a scenario when we have a limited phosphor supply. So think of this as a scenario with low to medium. Um, and in this case, there's not a whole lot of phosphor, but plants need to know. So they realize, hey, I need more roots. And then secondly, I need more uptake. And then at the same time, as the plant is growing, it's realizing that the older leaves, which are at the blow, they don't need as much phosphorus. So they retranslocate inorganic phosphorus within the plant. Um, at the same time, as I was saying, plants store a lot of phosphorus within the cells. So they can also mobilize and, and reuse that phosphorus. And they have another way of mycorrhiza, uh, in this case, that helps them extend the reach. Now, under these scenarios, plants are going to grow but maybe you won't get the yield that you will have under those circumstances. So something to, to keep in mind um, that in scenarios, when we have less phosphorus uh, availability, it's gonna limit the yield. You're not gonna get to that level, but at the same time, plants are not gonna die. They're gonna find a way to, to figure that out. So this is, a, plants are also lazy. It's like, you know, if we, you can find um, easily food, you don't have to cook, right? So it, it, that's another way the plants do it. And in this scenario, they can convert, if they have excess in organic phosphorus, they like, they convert into phytic acid. Um, at the same time, they say, we don't, I don't need to take more phosphorus. Uh, just like after a meal, you don't want to have another meal. Um, and if they have extra phosphorus, they want to get rid of it because when there's a more phosphorus within the plant, it can be toxic and kill the plant. So in other words, plants are very clever. They find way to manage. Or in other words, they want to maintain a constant level. Um, they, they like to stay stable. So the, 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 this is the, their coping mechanism that what they're gonna do. In other words, this is their plan B. Uh, and if that doesn't work, then they, they don't mind switching to another mode. Um, switching gears, they're talking about some of the phosphors and fertilizers. So just to get everyone on the same, um, on the same page that most of the phosphate fertilizers, they originate from rock phosphate. And there are many places in the country where we actively mine phosphorus, North Carolina, Florida. Um, the largest reserves of rock phosphate we have are in Morocco, for example. Um, so this is where we mine, and then we use different processes depending on what type of fertilizer material we need to make. So ultimately, with all the processes, you can end up with three fertilizer types. So one could be that's water soluble, available right away, and then second is moderately available, which means it's going to be available to the plants, and the third is slowly available. Um, so when you look into somewhere in the first two categories, you see most of the fertilizers that we use in, the, in most parts of the world. Either you're looking at triple super or you're looking at a combination with diammonium or monoammonium phosphate. Uh, we also have uh, dicalcium phosphate, which is within the, within the root zone. So um, when we apply these fertilizers into the soils, there, there, there are a lot of things, exciting things happen in the, in the soil. Um, and so let's see what those could be. So, so, so this slide shows you a couple things. One is, in this case, we are looking at when a fertilizer granule is applied. And so let's say if this is where the granule is applied. And if you go one inch away from the granule, you see that the phosphorus availability is very low. And that's because the phosphorus moves in the soil very differently, as I will show in the next slide. Um, another thing you see is, let's say if you look very close to the granule, so you're looking at the first day after fertilizer is applied, so a lot of phosphorus, but if you come back and then you look after four weeks, you will see that most of the phosphorus is gone. It's fixed in the soil. So, so this slide sort of emphasizes um, the, that where we should be applying fertilizer. They should be close to the root. Uh, and there's another slide to just kind of reiterate the same point uh, that if this is a fertilizer granule, uh, let's consider it zone one where the granule is sitting. Right next to that granule is what's called zone two. And assuming soil has enough moisture, this is going to solubilize the granule. And so you will have more availability in that scenario because there is water. So zone two, you're looking at one inch away from the granule. Um, and the zone three is anything beyond one inch. Um, so uh, some other points here that in the zone two we have high availability and in this case there's a lot of phosphorus and if there's a lot of iron and aluminum it can precipitate 
uh, precipitate means it can farm secondary mineral. Uh, in the zone three, you still have phosphorus availability. This is where we have iron and aluminum. They can absorb phosphorus from the solution. Um, so talking about how phosphorus moves in the soil, uh, a very little phosphorus moved by mass flow, which is here depicted in the zone two. Uh, and so in other words, mass flow is wherever water is going. So phosphorus is dissolved, it's gonna go with water. Um, the second is what's diffusion, which means concentration gradient. And in this case, if you have high concentration, it will move from high to low concentration. Um, so phosphorus is notoriously moves in soils by diffusion process. Um, most of the nitrate, potassium, for example, they go where water goes. So this also highlights that the phosphorus, when we apply, it needs to be close to the roots, or the plants are not going to be able to access it. So um, this, this is also a critical element when we are using the fertilizers and we are not seeing responses. So it's a good, good idea to go back and rethink, did we do band application, for example? Or if this is not where roots are, plants can't access it. Um, so talking about my favorite subject, uh, phosphorus and manures. So, so I'm going to ask you if you have an option to pick three manures, which one would be your favorite and why? Uh, so the first will be dairy manure and then poultry manure, and then hog manure. Who likes dairy manure? I like dairy manure. Who likes poultry litter? I like poultry litter. Who likes hog manure? You still like it, okay. <laughs> That's good. Uh, so yeah, so I, I, I worked with manures, I don't know. I, I, start, I stopped counting after 10 years because it's just way too much manure. So I went to Florida. <laughs> so looking at, this is some of the work I did when I was at University of Delaware. This is 2003, I believe. So we, there was a big project going on across five mid-Atlantic states. And the, the idea here was we were looking at diet modification, that when we are modifying animal diets, what's happening to the phosphorus in the feces, uh, what's happening to the lagoons, and then what's happening when this manure is land applied. Uh, and we were looking at leaching losses in this case. Um, so, the, so back then, there, this was a project with animal scientists. So they were coming up with these different diet formulations because historically, um, um, all the in-animal diets, our goal is we want to make sure there are enough minerals available for animal growth. So as a result, there was this buffer factor that there was more phosphorus added than the animals needed. And the idea, which is still okay, because you, we know that phosphorus is needed in the bones and teeth, so, so it can affect the animal growth. So there was this buffer factor. Um, and then back in 2000, National Research Council recommended that animals don't need. This was a comprehensive review of a lot of studies. Um, so there was an the emphasis that can we reduce phosphorus in the diets? So the idea is that if we are feeding less, we are getting less in the manures. Um, so this was a study where we went to 40 farms in the area and we looked at what's in the diets, what's in the manures, and the first thing we noticed was there, there's a 40% higher total phosphorus. So in, on, in other words, there's an opportunity that if we cut down what we are feeding in the diets, we can reduce what will come out in the manure. Um, so at the same time, this was a this good thing this project was with animal scientists because they were looking at animal reproduction, any, any other stats, to see if that, that can affect. So based on their data, they saw that the, the animals that are fed, fed low phosphorus diet, actually it's not low, it's the recommended level. Uh, and that there was enough phosphorus. So this was with the manures. Um, the second thing I was interested as a part of the project was that when we are changing or modifying diets, are we changing the phosphorus chemistry in the manures? Um, so in this case, uh, we looked into different diets. This is a sort of a combination of a lot of data. Uh, and the, the hair, the white pie is the orthophosphate or inorganic phosphorus. So we saw, okay, we have quite a bit in the diets. Uh, and then when we go into the feces, we see that, so these are the feces Actually, I had a lot of fun, believe it or not, collecting feces. And uh, this is, we are going on the dairy farms and we have a shovel. So the one lesson I learned very quickly was, you do not want to stand behind the cow. You want to be at a 45 degree angle. I think <laughs> this is what we figured out. And then you were good. So the, the, the reason why we were doing it was because once this hits uh, the ground, then we have bedding, then it's mixed. So we're gonna end up diluting. So we wanted to collect 
let's say, organic or fresh source <laughs> before anything happens to it. So we saw that animals are actually really good. And um, I, I don't know if you are animal scientists or have a, um, some um, understanding of animals. Uh, but in general, cows have a lot of phytase, which is an enzyme. So most of the diets have phytic acid, like on soybeans. So if the, when the cows have phytase, they can actually break down phytic acid and get phosphorus out and utilize it. So very good. When we look into legumes, we are like, oh, this is actually good because it doesn't matter what we are feeding. They are actually giving, producing manures with very similar phosphorus chemistry. Um, so this is in Mid-Atlantic. So this was a work, this was part of my PhD work in New Zealand. Uh, and in this case, we're looking at dairy effluent, which is a huge issue in Canterbury Plains. Uh, this is 99% liquid. So we are using some of the same tools and toys to see what's actually in the dairy effluent. And we are seeing it's very similar. So, I mean, they're cows, right? So they're going to do the same thing wherever you are. That's another way to look at it. Um, so then we thought, let's see with poultry. What do they do with the manures? Um, so again, there was another project going on looking at dietary modification using high available corn. So poultry is different. They don't have phytase in the gut. So they need to use, uh, then, so phytase need to be added for poultry to actually utilize the phytic acid, uh, which is, so there, this is again with all the poultry and nutritionists in the area working on modifying diets. This is a one combination of diets uh, um, that we worked on. So the first thing we also noticed was that by just modifying the diets, in other words, reducing the mineral phosphorus and adding phytase, you can reduce a lot of total phosphorus, so which is good because now we have manures with less phosphorus, which means less phosphorus will be land applied. Um, and then from the chemistry standpoint, uh, we looked at what's actually in the manure and we saw there's a lot of dicalcium phosphate. And if you remember, that that's one of the fertilizers, how we make it. So poultry is doing a really good job in making the, this wonderful fertilizer. So that's, that, so that's a positive side. Uh, then there's also another side that if we are using these uh, litters or we are forced to use this litter on some soils where we have a lot of phosphorus, maybe this is not so good, right? So, but, uh, so th this was the idea that if we look into the traditional um, you know, research on soil fertility, we know that, we've known at least, we've been using manures intentionally for at least for the last 200 years. We know it has a lot of organic matter, there's a lot of nitrogen, so it's a really valuable source to improve soil physical conditions as well as supply nutrients that plants need. Um, so the next thing we wanted to see was, okay, now we got dairy manures, we got poultry manures, and we wanted to see if we land apply, will this change the runoff, or in this case, leaching losses of phosphorus. So this was a big um, quarter that we borrowed from DuPont. We never gave it back. I think Amy still has it in Delaware. And it's actually very cool. So what you see is in the front, I'm going to show you in the next slide. So we cut a PVC section, and then we, we load it. This is a quarter, just like a soil quarter. And then we core into the soil, as you can see on this side, and then we collect this undisturbed soil core. And the idea was, if you want to put the soil back into the core, if you dig it, you disturbed it. So we disturbed the pore space, we disturbed everything that's in the soil, so we wanted to make sure that we are using a realistic field. And this is something um, that we can't really do in the field because we need to capture the leaches. So lysimetry is one of the very useful tool to understand what's happening in the, in the soil. Um, and so I cl we collected a lot of them. Uh, I was telling earlier, I will never forget, this is July 2004 in Georgetown and it's 80 degrees, 99% humid. Um, but it, it, was, it, was, it was useful work. We spent a lot of time collecting these cores. Uh, we brought them back into the lab and then we are using typical practices um, to s how we manage the applications. So this is a sort of summary slide that we had these range of manures, the dairy manures and, uh, and the brilo litters. So when we are applying into the soil, this is an example of two different soils. Um, and what we see is it doesn't matter in terms of what we have fed these cows or poultry. In the end, we are seeing very consistent leaching losses, very similar. So looking into the big picture, what it means is that if we are modifying the diets to decrease total phosphorus, it's a good idea. 
you're reducing total phosphorus, we are not changing the chemistry, and at the same time, it means that we wouldn't have any different leaching losses from these modified dyes. There was a, there was a concern back then that if we do that, we are going to make phosphorus more soluble. And as you saw in the manures that they made it better fertilizer. But the soil were able to fix most of the phosphorus that was added with the manures. Okay, so coming to another issue that we, we have these legacy phosphorus, and I'm sure this is kind of a new word uh, that everyone is sort of kind of fascinated with the word, but if you actually go back and you look into 70s and 80s literature, there were people talking about legacy <laughs> and legacy phosphorus. So um, here is a, a kind of brief intro to the phosphorus cycling. And I think this is kind of a, a story that I'm sure most of you sort of resonate or have heard the story um, that before World War II, um, we were farming in a very different way. It was small farms. Um, and on the same farm, there's a grain that's fed to the animals and then the manure was recycled back into the land to apply nutrients so they can grow crops. Um, the yields were not very high back then, so you're looking at 20 to 40 bushels per acre. Uh, so at the same time, you could maintain uh, that sort of cycle. So we have, we, have, we have fields, we have farm balances where they were actually pretty decent uh, at that back then. And then came the era of hybrids. So I'm not pointing fingers at at anyone, um, but it, it, it's actually good because um, the, the hybrids and the invention and use of fertilizers allowed us to grow tremendously in terms of population. But at the same time, we broke the phosphorus cycle. So in other words, now we are getting phosphorus fertilizer from Florida, North Carolina. We are producing grain in the Midwest and that grain is now coming into different areas. Uh, to provide for animal food. Um, so so, so in, in some ways, idly, if we can take the litter back, that will close the loop. But uh, I know there were some ideas tried with palatalizing, and then there is, a, um, there is another philosophical context to this that as a society, we haven't figured out how we're going to deal with this. And again, this is, uh, is kind of different in, in different places, but if we all as a taxpayer say, you know, I'm willing to pay a little bit more to take care of some of the waste. And this goes beyond animal manure. This is with biosolids. We, we can get the litter back where it's needed and useful. But that, that's part of the dilemma. How do, we, how do we balance, how do we deal with some of those issues? Um, another slide that shows that because of this, uh, um, because of this uh, era of uh, more producing more food, we have sort of created imbalances of phosphorus in different places in the country. So uh, we look here, we look into some dairy production areas in the country, we have more phosphorus in the soils uh, um, than it's needed. So again, like this is partly because we, if we look back into 50, 60 years ago, it's still in many parts of the country, the manures are typically used on nitrogen based because we get enough nitrogen. Uh, but most of the manures are an imbalanced fertilizer. And what I mean by that is there's a more phosphorus than what plants need. So if we keep applying on the nitrogen basis, imagine in 10 years there will be more phosphorus buildup that plants can't utilize. And that's part of the reason why we have high phosphorus in many soils. Uh, in some cases there have been concerns that we need more phosphorus than it's really needed. And I think it's also historic in some cases uh, that there's a belief system that we think that we need more fertilizers. Um, and uh, I don't know a whole lot about it, but I, I've been reading a little bit more that some of the recommendations, we don't really know how much we need. So as a result, we always want to be in the sufficiency zone so we have enough phosphorus available for plant growth. Um, and when we look into some of the you know, soil tests, we know that once you get into the high category, uh, there's going to be potential environmental implications. The phosphorus is going to leach and run off. Um, and we know that this is a dated slide, but still relevant that we have a lot of soils, in the, especially in Dalmarwa, where we have high phosphorus or excessive phosphorus. This is beyond crop needs. Uh, this is a more updated slide that when we look in Maryland, we know that we have 
areas where we have more soil phosphorus than the plant needs. And again, this is also historic because this did not happen overnight. Uh, this is not someone dumped money or last weekend. This happened over the last 40, 50 years. So something to keep in mind as we move forward, um, what do we do? And I think that's a very good and uh, practical question. Uh, um, looking into some of the other research, this, this was done as a part of uh, the dairy or poultry project. Um, so in this graph, there are three soils. Uh, in this case, you're looking at total phosphorus. This is soluble phosphorus. So we kind of collected soils where the soil phosphorus was in the optimum category. Um, and then another, when we have environmental threshold, which is 150 milligrams per kilogram mahalic three, um, the first thing we saw was that we have more leaching in the environmental category, which you expect because the soils are saturated. They cannot absor absorb more phosphorus. Uh, but what, what was more interesting was that after we applied fertilizer, which is this line, you saw there's a large increase in phosphorus losses. And this is because we have sort of the soil's capacity to hold phosphorus is saturated or very close to saturation. So the soil is, can't hold more phosphorus. So then you're going to have leaching concerns and other concerns. And that's one of the reasons why um, once we get into environmental category, there's going to be environmental impact. And we know when you are in the environmental group, there's enough phosphorus available for plant growth and productivity. Uh, so some of, the, some of the conclusions here that if we have phosphorus saturated soils, you can expect to see more losses. And another thing, let's not forget, we have a lot of soils that have these bypass flows. There are cracks and roots and macropores. So that can really magnify the leaching losses from those fields. Um, so imagine there's a crack and fertilizer is applied and it's soluble, it can quickly move down through the crack. So there are, we have some, some situations in the, in, in the area where we have those issues as well. So again, like this is a, Nicole asked me to put this slide. Uh, no, she didn't. <laughs> so this is actually a really cool slide because what do we do? if we have some soils that are saturated. So this was an experiment started in 1992. So there are different applications where they added a lot of manure up to 1600. Um, I, I don't know, remember the units, but you can see when you add a lot of manure, this is controlled, so you have about 50. When we keep adding the higher rates, we are getting up to 400. So this is the event every, every year in the spring, collected samples, analyzed, and looked at the Malik 3. And then you can see that it's decreasing slowly, not quickly. So this is our, 100 is our, in this case, optimum range. Um, they also calculated that under these treatments, each year you're removing about 3 to 4 percent. So we're reducing soil phosphorus, uh, but at the same time it's slow. And if you want to know the time scale, and this is scary number to look at it, that we, if we have soils that have very high concentrations, it's going to be a while before these values decrease. So, um, so in this case, we need to figure out what we need to do. So uh, it's recorded, so we'll take some questions at the end. Uh, so I, th I think one of the goal is that we want to keep these levels within the optimum. That's, the, that's one of the message I want you to, to remember when you walk out from this room. Um, if you're looking for CEU, there are several ways. This is a good place to check certified crop advisors. Uh, you can read more about this uh, legacy phosphorus study. If, if you want to, you can also get CEUs. So some of the take home message that pH is critical uh, for plant availability. Soil phosphorus pool is tiny, but everything is in equilibrium. Uh, plants are clever. They're going to find a way to take up. Um, uh, phosphorus fertilizes quickly fixed. So when we apply it, think about where that is going. So bending starter fertilizer is a great idea. So you keep it close to the roots. Um, look at manures. Uh, we have known that we have manures with very similar phosphorus chemistry. We have concerns um, which are supported by data. Uh, we know that the phosphorus drawdown is very extremely slow. Uh, this is something we need to figure out. But I think this is kind of my last message here. Um, that we need to look at soil test phosphorus. It should be within optimum range. 
And I think this is a, this is a one key. Once we get to environmental level, uh, there's going to be other regulatory issues. There are also going to be issues, concerns with phosphorus losses. So if we can keep it within the optimum need, what plants need, I think we all can benefit from that. So, so with that, with that we'll take some questions. If there's time, or you can catch me later, I will be here all day today, tomorrow. They're clapping for lunchtime. No, sure. What was that? They're clapping because it's lunchtime. <laughs>